I sail an ocean, unsettled ocean, through restful waters and deep commotion, often frightened, unenlightened. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Hello, I'm Dr. Gary Onick, and I'm your host for Cancer is Tough, But You're Tougher. I want to thank the Beach Boys for allowing us to use a piece of music that is dear to my heart. My podcast is uniquely personal. I know both sides of the cancer equation. I am a cancer specialist and researcher, as well as a cancer patient and survivor. I will address uh, various treatment modalities in the podcast, but that's not really what this podcast is about. This podcast is about uh, the unique cancer journey that a patient and their family and friends take when they are diagnosed and treated with this dread disease. We'll delve into the inner emotional and spiritual resources patients and their loved ones need to address their concerns of choosing a treatment strategy that will harmonize uh, with their worldview while grappling with state-of-the-art treatments uh, versus uh, alternative treatments. When I was asked who's going to be my target audience, the obvious answer was everyone. There's a rare person that has not had cancer touch their lives either as a patient, a family member, or a friend. If you're that rare person that hasn't had cancer touch their lives, wait a while. Almost certainly at some point, cancer will drag you into its maelstrom. I hope that you find this show both a resource and a comfort in dealing with your cancer journey. Stop the crying and the lying and the sighing and my dying. Sail on, sail on, sail on. So I'm proud to have uh, our first celebrity guest uh, on our podcast, uh, Lisa D. or Dempsey, soon to be known uh, as AKA Mrs. Hope, but more about that later. Uh, Lisa is one of the most respected news magazine producers in the country. She serves as the senior executive uh, producer of the Emmy winning news magazine Extra now in its 28th season. Mm -hmm. That is a longevity that must be very unusual for the uh, TV industry. Uh, And uh, her position at Telepictures Productions. She works on development of new television series, utilizing Extra as a lab to create and nest other original content and programming. Uh, I was interested to see in looking uh, at your uh, bio that you created one of the first shows around a celebrity doctor, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Oh, oh, you know what? We had a show called Life Changers where it was- it was the best of the best, mainly doctors. And basically celebrities could get to these doctors, but the public couldn't. I mean, it took a lot of, you know, who you know. Yeah. And I actually, so anyway, we put Dr. Drew Pinsky, who is also a doctor, he's an internist, in as the host of the show. And he had mainly been known as a, you know, great, guest on shows but this was one of his he had and he had done radio and he had done some other reality shows but he had never done a syndicated show so we did put him on that show yeah yeah so so you really in a sense launched him oh no in a way. oh no. <laughs> no i did not oh i think you're being modest so <laughs> yes him i'm not being modest. Pretty well known. So, uh you've also won a bunch of emmys i'm not sure a bunch is the uh, proper uh, name for that. It, I, you know, it's, it's a herd of Emmys or a, a gaggle, but uh, you've won a, a bunch of Emmys. So, so yeah, you are 
extremely accomplished um, in your world. Uh, and we can take all of our time discussing your media, media career, but that's not why we're here. Um, as I said, I'm, I've got some trepidation doing this because uh, uh, I'm an amateur at this. It's like I'm, I'm getting up at the tee with uh, Tiger Woods. So if, so if I, if I, if I slice it into the woods, um, uh, you'll, you'll just cut me some slack. Okay. Listen, Tiger Woods can't save people's lives like you do. So I'm going with you every time. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so, uh, let me, let me get to, to some of your background because it's important and germane to what we're talking about. Okay. Um, Growing up, uh, as I understand, you grew up in California. I grew up actually in New Jersey, um, but and most of my career has been in California. Though, although in news, I went all over the country to crazy places. So when you were growing up, uh, you were you were, you were Jewish, mm -hmm. and uh, were you? Did you live in a Jewish neighborhood? Lived in a Jewish neighborhood. Um, yeah, I did. Went to Temple, the whole shebang. I, I was never bat mitzvahed. I was a kid in the back of the class, you know, throwing spitballs. And uh, and so you had this, this, I think, what is a pretty typical Jewish background, um, just like mine. I mean, I was, um, uh, grew up in a Jewish neighborhood and and uh, I was bar mitzvahed, but um, for me, being bar mitzvahed was the um, like a right of the cel well, it was a celebration of freedom, actually. So I didn't have to go to Hebrew school anymore, <laughs> <laughs> and so I wasn't really uh, I wasn't uh, you know from a terribly religious family. But um, I think that's the way a lot of Jewish families are. Um, a bit more secular sometimes, and uh, and so uh, you know that's that's your your background. Now everything's going great. You're you've got this amazing career, um, terrific family, great husband, you know, kids. No kids. And no kids. No kids. Okay. So I oh okay. I I thought you see I'm doing research on the web and that was fake news. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, that's okay. <laughs> it sounds like you, you and I were both Jew emphasis on ish. Yes. Right. Yes, okay. definitely. So, um, so everything's going great. And then one day you get this world shaking news. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. Okay. So it's funny you were talking about Emmys because I was sitting at my desk in my office at work and I was about to go to the Emmys and I had a gown on and they were waiting downstairs, my crew for me to go. And I get a call from my husband, Gary on the golf course, who basically says to me, Hey, I just heard from um, the doctor. Remember that test, you know, I took the other day. Um, and it seems that I have, um, he thought he had skin cancer. And I couldn't really hear him that well because the wind was blowing out on the golf course. And I was like, what? I don't understand. So I was like, "Get, let's get the doctor on a call. So he gets the doctor on the call. And then the doctor says um, he, they found some cancer in the, in the back of Gary's tongue. And um, he's going to have, it's very curable. He's going to have to get radiation and maybe a little bit of chemo, but he'll be fine. Well, that's not like, that's not like a little, you know, skin cancer on your hand. So I start Googling and I don't really understand. And I burst out crying and I run down the stairs of extra. And we also had another show on it at the time called Crime Watch Daily. And um, I run past my extra crew and my Crime Watch crew, get in my car. I don't tell anybody that I'm not going to the Emmys. I take off and I go home. Oh, wow. So, you know, we're a little unclear on exactly what this means and we're trying to figure out, okay, so how do we find an oncologist? That's the next step. 
and we ended up it's, it, it's so crazy, like the people God puts in your path for a season, for a reason, but people who will change your path. So Mark McGrath used to be the host of Extra. He's the lead singer in Sugar Ray. Um, and his best friend is a radiologist at Cedars named Dr. Amin Merhadi. So I call him, I mean, I text him and he calls me right back. And he said, okay, calm down. I'm going to get you in tomorrow like you're my sister. We just recruited this guy from Sloan Kettering in New York to be the head of radiology. He looks like Doogie Howser. His name is Dr. <laughs> he said, he said, we won this like bidding war. But he said, you will love him. And he works with Dr. Cher. The two of them in tandem will get Gary through this. Next day we had an appointment. We went in. I don't think we knew, you know, what was in store because we were, Gary was about to start radiation. And two weeks later, I get a call from him. I'm in my office in a meeting. I get a call. I always take his calls. He said, don't panic, but I just fainted. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, I just fainted. Um, my friend George is going to take me to our concierge doctor, meet me there. So I go and I meet him there. Well, fast forward to him back at Cedars, this time in the emergency room, his um, electrical system and his heart gave out. So the next day he had to get a pacemaker. This is before we even start yeah. radiation. So nothing's easy. <laughs> Nothing uh, simple. I'm like, do, 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 do. oh, cancer, do, 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 do. Wait, uh, heart problem. So this is, this is also a tangential story, but so we're in the ER and Gary's heart rate goes down to 37, which, yeah, and just as it happens, the head of all of the electrocardiologists walks by Dr. Goodman. All the cardiologists are, Gary, are out, um, at some big convention, but only the best is left behind to cover for them. He goes, Oh, you need me <laughs> into the room. He's like a God it, and it parts the red sea because all the doc bunch of doctors, bunch of nurses come in and he grabs like a paper towel and he explains Gary's electrical system in his heart, why he needs a pacemaker. Okay. So surgery scheduled for the next morning. Cause Gary had just eaten. That night at about two in the morning, his heart rate goes down to 27. And I'm sitting there kind of not understanding what's going on exactly, but Gary finally fell asleep and it's two in the morning. In walks, can we curse on your podcast? Sure. Okay. In walks the asshole cardiologist of the century. This guy's a fellow and he's got another doctor in tow. And he basically comes up to me and says, are you Mrs. Dempsey? And I said, yes. And he goes, your husband's probably not going to make it through the night. I'm like, what? Well, that's um, completely inappropriate, I think. Right. Uh <laughs> well, he's, he says, I'm probably going to have to use the paddles on him. So this wakes Gary up. Gary looks up at him and he says, Mr. Dempsey, you know, your heart rate is really falling rapidly and we might have to use the paddles and you're in dire straits. Gary looks up at him very calmly and says, actually, I am going to make it through the night and I'm going to be on the operating table at 6 a.m. with Dr. Goodman and he's going to give me a pacemaker just like we arranged. And this guy, when he hears Dr. Goodman, the god of the hospital, he's like, oh, Dr. Goodman, uh, Okay. And then he and the other guy like scurry away. And the next morning got the pacemaker. He was fine. Thank God. <laughs> so we had a, a, a bump in the road of, of the cancer treatment. Yeah. How did it proceed from there? Okay. So we, um, we stay the course. I mean, Gary, you know, recovers in two to three weeks, you know, he was more worried about not being able to go back on the golf course. And then we, he starts the radiation. Um, he gets three big doses of chemo through over these seven weeks, comes out, 
Now, all the while, I'm, you know, I just pray in my car. So I'm praying in my car. I start reading some Max Lucado books during this time just, you know, for peace. And, you know, I was obviously anxious about it, but I didn't want Gary to see. And he's losing weight. So every single week is a different battle. Like, will he or won't he need a feeding tube? Because he's lost, you know, he ends up losing like 37 pounds, 38 pounds. So I'm reading Max Lucado. Then I start reading the New Testament. And Gary sees me, you know, when we're home on the couch and he sees me reading this and doesn't pay any mind. And I read him little passages, doesn't pay any mind. Because I hadn't mentioned this. He started out in upstate New York and Binghamton as being Methodist. And then he really didn't follow religion because his um, grandfather was a pastor and it was very fire and brimstone. And it almost scared him. When he married me, he converted to Judaism. I never asked him to convert. Oh. He just thought it was a beautiful religion. So he was more Jewish than you and me. You meaning you. Yeah, definitely more Jewish than me. <laughs> right. Right. So, uh, yeah. you know, so all the while I'm praying in my own way. And, you know, Gary still doesn't get on the prayer wagon and he's not necessarily practic practicing Judaism. So he gets through the treatment. He's very thin, but gets back out on the golf course, gets back to doing everything that he does, you know, athletically. And we're fine. Two and a half years go by. You know, all the people with this kind of cancer we know are fine, cured, basically. He, okay, so... He still goes every six months for his CAT scans. This one day he goes for a CAT scan. He has a bad reaction to the dye. We're sitting at breakfast, you know, and we were really blessed because doctor, the doctor will call us that same day with the results. We're sitting at breakfast and all of a sudden his back starts hurting, like doubled over, excruciating pain. Then... Um, all of a sudden he starts shaking uncontrollably like this. I get him into the car. I, don't, I literally don't know if I should go to the ER or go to the concierge doctor. I drive to the concierge doctor. I mean, his body is shutting down because of this reaction and because of dehydration, which we don't know. Well, his concierge doctor doesn't know what to do. He throws a blanket over him. I'm like, I, I could have done that. <laughs> <laughs> This is not good. <laughs> well, Wait, it gets I mean, worse. I'm just, you know, I, uh, I don't mean to laugh at it, but, but have, what else can but you do? You have to laugh at it. It's, right. right. Yep. So he, this doctor, I won't say his name because no one will ever go to him again, um, calls the paramedics. Calls paramedics to come to his office. They show up, these sort of swaggering guys. Instantly, they figure out that he's dehydrated, and he explains about the, they tell him he probably had a bad reaction to the dye. But just to be safe, we go in their, you know, siren vehicle to the ER, which is like front door pass, right? You get right in with, if you're in an ambulance. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so... He's sitting, you know, in bed. We call our two uh, friends who I work with are like daughters to us. Um, they both come and show up and we're there. And it's unusual because the doctor normally will call us two hours later and tell us the results. And thank God they've all been good. Well, two and a half years in, I'll never forget the doctor lumbers in with his head down. And I'm like, oh, that is not his normal disposition. This is not good. And he basically says, well, this is not what we hope for. Um, the cancer has metastasized uh, to your lung. But then he said, but it's not as bad as it sounds because it's literally only one nodule. It's one nodule. And it's in a place in your lung in the lobe that's very receptible. And I've had this before and only a couple times because normally it metastasizes to a lot of places and it didn't. 
So I don't know, you're blessed, he basically said. And, you know, Gary sort of had tears in his eyes and he's a tough guy and he had never really, I'd not seen him cry very many times. And he was like sort of in a why me mode, which he also could never feel sorry for himself. So I, you know, felt helpless, but I just prayed and prayed and prayed. Found the best doctor for him to actually have the lung surgery, have the lung resected. He got over that pretty quickly. And we had just bought a house in Naples. And I had four years left on my contract. We moved here on Christmas Day, 2019. Sidebar had just changed the show to be the show behind the show. So you literally could see us making the show. But instead of in my office, Billy Bush and I would talk over Zoom. Coincidentally, it was during COVID. So everyone basically went home except for like 12 people in my office. So that was sort of divine intervention in the craziest possible way. December 25th, I wake up that morning Gary is reading the Bible, the Old Testament. Gary is reading my Max Lucado books. Gary is reading a devotional. He starts, which he hasn't, we both haven't missed a day since, this ritual of getting up at 4.44 in the morning and comes out here for an hour and a half on his own, reads everything, absorbs everything. I come out for another hour I translate the Bible for that day, whatever chapter we're on. And then he will sort of preach a chapter from Billy Graham, Max Lucado, Anne Graham, Joyce Meyer, you name it. We started reading all these Christian books. And then we, I mean, this is hard for me because my uncle runs a temple in Boca. So I haven't been out of this. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, some, of, some of my family know, but not all. And I mean, we haven't missed a day and we are Christian and we've dedicated our lives to Jesus. And I really feel like everything before that, I never felt totally protected or safe or understood any of it. I didn't understand the Holy Spirit, how that in, you know, indwells us after you're saved. You know, the only thing I didn't do is get baptized and get my hair wet because, you know, Jewish hair is <laughs> not good. So that's, that's basically my story. And we're two well, and a half years out of the, the one nodule. Uh, and so you're two and a half years out from the nodule and everything is cool. Well, he just, yeah, he just got a CAT scan and thank God, all clear. Yeah. So, you know, my thoughts on prayer. Um, I love uh, how you came to prayer. Um, it was um, a, uh, I mean, doctors are trained and, and inherently atheists uh, from our training. That's, well, hang on, that's pretty profound. When you come out and say that, that oh, that's right, because they think they're God. Well, <laughs> well, do you know the old joke where uh, the uh, uh, the uh, in heaven they're at the cafeteria and there's uh, a line to get the food and a little old man in a white coat with a stethoscope around his neck cuts in front and one of the People in line said, that's not fair. And the, the other person goes, shh, that's God. He's playing doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. So, so uh, yeah. Uh, so we're, we are trained. I mean, we're naturally atheists because we're empiricists. We believe in science. And uh, science for 200 years has really separated us from God. Because if you're an empiricist, you say, if you can't touch it, feel it, then it's not real. And uh, I needed science to bring me to uh, a profound faith in God. I needed to see, number one, evidence. And I saw that in my own uh, practice, 
where patients were being healed, one in particular, uh, was healed by prayer only. And so, uh, and I, I needed to see a, uh, a scientific underpinning for uh, God. And uh, quantum physics um, is, is creating a very, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful a time to be in because science is now bringing us back to God. Quantum physics is showing us, it doesn't show us that God exists, but it shows us how God could do and affect all of the things that we have, have just had to have faith for. And now through this basically vibrational field that, that um, is, is everywhere and every a square millimeter of the universe is filled by it. Well, that is, in my mind, the way God works and exists and affects us because our consciousness affects things. Well, when, no you talk, when you talk yeah. about quantum physics, I saw how you took a quantum leap to actually, yes, you're evidence-based, but to have faith in the unseen because believing in God is hoping in the unseen. Oh, uh, uh, of, of course, you have to, uh, you know, there is, nothing is going to prove that God exists. I needed to see that there could be a foundation scientifically for that to happen. You could, you can see that foundation. I mean, you know, there are, you know, legions of physicists that are still atheists and uh, who have the quantum basis, but, but actually use it to deny that there's a God. Uh, until something happens in their own life. Until something <laughs> happens in their own life. Until something focuses their uh, attention on um, the fact that they need something beyond this. The fact they that they're flesh and human. And to me, anything I can dream or imagine, I have to tell you, once you give your life to what, you know, Jesus, like I did, um, and I'm not a Jew for Jesus because I'm not a Jew anymore. Um, once you give your life, God, Gary, God creates a life for you that's so much bigger and better than anything you as a mere human could imagine. That's what I found. And that is so beautiful. That is, that is wonderful. And I, and as, as a Jew, I cavell for you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't give yourself a pin of horror while you're <laughs> Oh, so so you've told some stories uh, about doctors that haven't been exactly um, perfect, mm -hmm. and uh, I I want you to know I found this on the web, and uh, can you see that? Oh, is that my friend Steve and I reading? Uh, oh, a friend of ours. Yeah. Yes. It, uh -huh. Yes. Yes. It, it basically says, um, "Don't let your doctor kill you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you know Dr. Erica Schwartz in New York? She's a friend of mine, and she wrote that book. She's well, and and I think that um, you know there's there is some truth to that. As you've seen, uh, uh, physicians are on a a bell curve too. I mean, there are there are great ones, there are you know good competent ones, and and then there are uh, people who are terrible. Terrible, terrible about what they do. And, and one of the most disturbing things about medicine um, is that um, we tend to protect our psychopaths. Hmm. Explain. Uh, that, uh, for instance, I'll give, you, I'll give you a for instance. There's a, a patient who's coming to me who, a uh, very sophisticated patient, uh, needed to have his prostate removed, was referred to a doctor to remove his prostate. And 
in the operation. He was, you know, had uncontrolled bleeding and complication after complication. And now he has a tube draining his bladder. And the nurse, after it said, I'm so sorry, I didn't tell you. He does this to everybody. What? Yes. Yes. And there are, there are a number of books about, about this situation where doctors end up going from place to place. And, uh, you know, there are psychopaths in every field and doctors have, have their share of them, you know, sociopaths who just don't care about how the patient does. I mean, it's, it's not prevalent, but you see it. And I've seen it in my, I've seen it in my own career as well. Well, obviously, I mean, these guys are incompetent and they have to probably leave the state, but isn't that why they make vetting and health grades and, you know, all sorts of different. Well, you should be uh, now with the internet, you might be able to find um, some information on somebody to steer you in the other direction. But uh, I mean, it it goes beyond that. I mean, there are um, patient, there are doctors that I've seen that they're not just incompetent. They are, uh, sociopaths, where they will they'll do an operation when there's nothing wrong with the patient, right? Or they'll do an operation on on someone that's not going to fix the problem just to do an operation. So, the, so that sounds like those they're mercenaries. Yeah, uh, it, it's uh, yeah. So so we all um, I think every profession has them, but uh, it's 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 disturbing because we tend to not call them out um the way we should and i've been guilty of it myself i got i have to tell you i've been guilty I, I, of it I don't myself believe, i don't believe that you mean of not calling out maybe of not of not calling out um of of not saying now what's interesting is that the person i didn't call out uh everyone else knows anyway i mean it's so it's so known within the uh, profession in our area, and it's so known with Aaron Hospital. I could have done my calling out, and everybody's like, "Sure, <laughs> what else is new?" Right. <laughs> but, but we don't want to, so we're not going to play charades to figure out who that is. But yes, yes, it. Uh, you know, uh, with no, we're not. No. If you look me up, you might see an association somewhere. But uh, no, no, it's. Uh, Anyway, so I got off on a tangent that probably uh, was not a good thing. Uh, I'd like to ask you one one more question. Sure. And because um, you, you've been so gracious to give me so much of your time. Uh, is it uncomfortable? Uh, has your Christianity given put you in a position that has made you, in some instances, uncomfortable or some instances um, affected your career or? uh... Not even for one second. Really? Honestly, I feel, as a matter of fact, I feel like these kind of celebrity shows, there are so many of them out there. One thing that actually distinguishes us from the others is I put people like the Max Lucados and, you know, I, I don't just do all celebrity. Celebrities follow different people in their own religions. And it doesn't mean I wouldn't put a rabbi on either, but I do feel like I'll go into religion a little bit on extra just for a feel good ending to the show. I mean, Billy, you know, sort of is a stoic and he reads a lot, you know, after the whole thing happened with him and Trump, you know, he went into a deep hole, but it was through different religious people and books that brought him out. So we've all been touched by an angel and by religion in our own way. And I feel like it's very relatable. So after you get your fill of, you know, Brad Pitt and Taraji P. Henson and all these celebrities, I do like to try to leave you with a thought starter in some way, or with somebody who's written a book. and, And that's, you know, and I am obsessed with 
just doctors in general. My whole family is lawyers. I have a superior court judge and six lawyers in my family. So <laughs> I, but my, my uncle told me that my grandfather lived in the woods and was a big healer in his day, my great-great-grandfather. And I'm just obsessed with trying to hook. They call me the doctor whisperer because I try to hook up people with the exact right doctor. Because one thing Life Changers taught me is there's a specialist in every field who's the top of the top. And I actually media trained this neurosurgeon, Dr. Martin, who is like number two in the world for aneurysms and strokes. And so I became very close to him and got on the advisory board at UCLA of neurosurgeons, me and like 20 neurosurgeons. So a lot of people with brain situations, I mean, I really can help in that area. And I feel like instead of just doing like the celebrity show, I also feel like I want to get to heaven. And this is, you know, I, I have a big forum to help other people, which I try to use it for. That is a wonderful thing. And you are, um, you earned your moniker of Mrs. Hope because uh, you're giving, yay, because, Hope. because you're giving people, you are, uh, you've got a forum and you're giving people hope through that by the guests you choose, by the things you say. And uh, so uh, I want to, I want to thank you so much for giving us your time. And, um, um, until we meet again until we meet again hopefully um, you know not having nothing to do with my right. job right well Dr. Hope and Mrs. Hope you know we met for a reason so when well, I come, no... you're, I'm taking you to lunch when I come to Fort Lauderdale sometime wonderful and uh, you know we'll go out to Naples my my, my, my well my girl and I you know your, and your girl my girl okay. and I and we'll uh yeah, well, look we'll me, if you do look me up and we'll go out to dinner or something. Yeah, okay? it sounds great. And give my best to, to Gary. And, uh, you, Gary. you know, I will put uh, him in my prayers. He, and we'll keep you in our prayers. We have a lot of Gary's in our lives. <laughs> this is the a segment of our a program where we offer hope. It's our hope segment aptly named. And uh, in this segment, we try and go through uh, the new information that's coming out that indicates that there is a hopeful new treatment or management path for uh, a particular type of cancer. So in this segment, we're going to talk about a study that was published or at least presented on carboxantinib plus atezolizumab moves towards regulatory filing in high risk MCRPC. So, for those that do not have a medical degree or any understanding of what is going on in prostate cancer, which is going to be the majority of uh, our listeners, uh, what does that even mean? Well, first off, what is castrate resistant, metastatic castrate resistant prostate cancer called CRPC? The main treatment, the standard treatment for patients with prostate cancer is castration, either physical, but usually now, uh, pharmacologic castration. So it's to block the testosterone that these cancers feed on. So you block the testosterone. The cancer doesn't have the testosterone to grow anymore, which it needs to grow. And the cancer regresses and is put more into a dormant state than actually uh, killed. Great stuff if, and actually uh, uh, there was a Nobel Prize won for that, for that discovery. The name of the person escapes me right now, 
who who came up with it. But uh, it's obviously got a lot of side effects, and and but it saves not not exactly save lives because eventually the cancer uh, finds out and figures out a way around this mechanism. Uh, so it's it's not a curative uh, treatment, but it certainly is uh, uh, a treatment that is longevity uh, producing in prostate cancer patients. So what does CRPC mean? Well, that's castrate resistant prostate cancer. So when the cancer figures out how to get around castration, it becomes castrate resistant. And for castrate resistant patients, there are few really good uh, options. There's chemotherapy, uh, and that has been shown to uh, prolong survival by about four months in a good number of studies. It comes not without side effects, uh, but it's uh, a quiver, an arrow in the quiver for patients with castrate resistant uh, prostate cancer. Uh, there is a new treatment called lutetium-177 that is a radiologic treatment for patients with uh, castrate resistant prostate cancer. And so now we have uh, a new combination that has been tested in an early study what they call a phase 1B study, uh, which is looking at safety and early efficacy um, in uh, this group. And uh, basically, uh, atezolizumab is uh, what we call a checkpoint inhibitor. Uh, It is an immunologic treatment. Uh, There are molecules on prostate cancer cells that turn off your immune system. And uh, atezolizumab, or tecentric, um, as its uh, trade name is called, uh, basically gets in between your immune cell and the cancer and keeps this mechanism from turning off your immune cells. Now, what's interesting is that when this was tested alone, it did not make any difference in survival for prostate cancer patients. In this case, however, they're combining it with a drug called cabozantinib. And uh, cabozantinib, also trade named Cabomedix, is... Uh, what is called a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. What's a tyrosine kinase inhibitor? Well, a tyrosine kinase is used by cancer to basically grow blood vessels. So if you can block uh, tyrosine kinase and inhibit it, then the cancer will, will be less likely to, or less have less ability to grow grow blood vessels, and therefore will have uh, a stop on its growth. The hope was when you combine these two, that you would get a result that you might not get with either one alone. So in this study, what they found was that the objective response rate was 27%, meaning you could measure the response in these patients. You could you could look at their tumors um, getting smaller. And there was a 2% complete response rate. Now, any complete response rate in this group of patients is a, uh, a significant thing. And uh, really uh, is a very exciting thing. So uh, this is going to, so this is a very exciting study and obviously it's very early, but if this can be reproduced in a larger study, then this could be a very significant uh, 
new path for treatment of this very difficult uh, patient population. So this is the portion of the show, the mailbag, where listeners get to send in their questions uh, for us to answer. The first question is from Annabelle in New York. You have talked about how important your relationship with God is when recovering from cancer. What is your advice for somebody who feels like God has abandoned them to cancer? That's really uh, a difficult question, particularly for somebody um, like me who is not uh, a theologian or someone who regularly counsels people about uh, theological issues. But what I can say is this. The most important aspect of your question uh, is that you still have a relationship with God. You just feel like, why did he give me this? Uh, Why am I, why do I have cancer? It's, It's similar to Uh, The question of, uh, well, you know, why does God do or allow terrible things to happen to children? We don't know, first off, uh, what God is thinking or what his plan is for us. Uh, the, The occurrence that seems a bad, Uh, and terrible right now, um, in retrospect, a year down the line, might not appear to be uh, a negative thing. So I guess what I would say is this. You've discovered that you have cancer. God has not abandoned you. He is there. You just don't know what his plan is for you. And so I would still have faith and I would uh, give the process time. And uh, I think more than likely you'll end up where you're supposed to be. If you would like to ask us a question, you can go to garyonicmd.com. There is a contact form that you can fill out and it will send us your question and hopefully we'll be able to answer it uh, on the air. Thank you for listening to our podcast. I hope that it provided you with some useful information, some hope, and some comfort. Thank you very much. Sail on, sail on, sail on. Sail on, sail on, sail on.